G'day viewers, I'm Adam Stokes. Welcome back to the channel where we're exploring what is happening in the oil crisis. This is the next chapter of the oil crisis, perhaps the industry shutting down an article written by Bloomberg. Before we get into this, make sure you check out my recent video about the collapse of the petrodollar and how that will likely lead to war. This, as mentioned, is the next chapter of the collapse of the petrodollar written by Javier Blas of Bloomberg. It reads, negative oil prices, ships dawdling at sea with unwanted cargoes and traders getting creative about where to stash oil. The next chapter in the oil crisis is now inevitable. Great swathes of the petroleum industry are about to start shutting down. The economic impact of the coronavirus has ripped through the oil industry in dramatic phases. First, it destroyed demand as lockdowns shut factories and kept drivers at home. Then, storage started filling up and traders resorted to ocean-going tankers to store crude oil in the hope of better prices ahead. Now shipping prices are surging to stratospheric levels as the industry runs out of tankers, a sign of just how distorted the market has become. Now breaking away from this article for a bit about the distortion of the market, we could see that these producers were pushing out so much oil, they had nowhere to put it because no one was buying it, so they went to unconventional methods of using ocean-going tankers as storage places for all of this oil. Of course, normally tankers take oil from one place to another, and it's meant to be a quick trip to push that oil out so we can keep this cycle going and the companies can keep making money. But in the hopes that oil prices would go up, especially when prices were negative, companies took the risk and used ships to store this oil at an astronomical cost. But they hoped that the price would go up so they could sell it for better days ahead. Well, of course, when the price isn't going up, the issue is compounded in the sense that ships cost a lot of money to hire. And when you're getting zero return on what you're hiring it for, this being storing oil, you just compound the situation. And it leads to, as this article is talking about, the collapse of many industries. But reading on, the spectre of production shuts down and the impact they will have on jobs, companies, their banks, and local economies was one of the reasons that spurred world leaders to join forces to cut production in an orderly way. But as the scale of the crisis dwarfed their efforts, failing to stop prices diving below zero last week, shutdowns are now a reality. It's the worst case scenario for producers and refiners. Again, breaking away from the article, if we look at what was happening in America, investing in the shale oil industry, shale oil is a very expensive industry comparative to oil drilling where you can simply get, if you will, clean oil straight out of the ground. Imagine just putting a straw in the ground and sucking that oil out, that is very easy to get out. Or well, comparative to shale oil, where it is essentially mixed with lots of rocks, shale, dirt, and other debris, it needs a lot more energy and cost to separate the oil from the ground. And as America has invested heavily into this industry recently, we now see the, the problem is compounded again. A lot of investment has been put into this type of drilling, this type of oil refinery, where they're taking, or not refinery, but extraction of oil out of the ground. And because it is very labor intensive and very damaging to the environment as well, but no one's buying oil now, this is an industry that is gonna be hit very hard. When the oil industry is turned back on per se, people are going to go for the cheaper option of oil, which is essentially taking it out of the oil wells that are well established and it's easy to get that oil out of the ground. America is going to be hit hard in particular. I should say the American oil industry is gonna be hit hard because they've put significant investment into shale oil. And as the whole world is collapsing in the oil industry, shale oil, of course, will be the first to go down because it's the most expensive type of oil. Reading on, we are moving into the end game Torjborn Torngvist, I don't know if I'm saying that right, Torjborn Torngvist, head of commodity trading giant Gunver Group, said in an interview, early to mid-May could be the peak. We are weeks, not months away from it. In theory, the first oil output cuts should have come from the OPEC Plus alliance, which earlier this month agreed to reduce production from May 1. Yet, after the catastrophic price plunge on Monday, when West Texas, Texas Intermediate fell to negative $40 a barrel, it's the US shale patch that is leading. The best indicator of how the US industry is reacting is the rapid drop in the number of oil rigs in operation, which last week fell to a four-year low. Before the coronavirus hit, oil companies ran about 650 rigs in the US. By Friday, more than 40% of them had stopped working with only 378 left. 
Monday really focused people's minds that production needs to slow down Ben Lukok, co-head of oil trading at commodity merchant Trafugo Group, said. It's the smack in the face the market needed to realise this is serious. Trafigura, one of the largest exporters of US crude oil from the US Gulf of Mexico, believes that output in Texas, New Mexico, North Dakota and the other states will now fall much faster than expected as some companies react to negative prices, which have persisted for several days last week in the physical market. Until prices collapsed on Monday, the consensus was that output would drop by about 1.5 million barrels a day by December. Now, market watchers see that loss by late June. The severity of the price pressure is likely to act as a catalyst for the intermediate turndown in activity and shut-ins, said Roger D1, oil analysis consultant IHS Market Limited. The price shock has been particularly intense in the physical market. Producers of crude streams such as South Texas Sour and Eastern Kansas Common had to pay more than $50 a barrel to offload their output last week. ConocoPhillips and shale producer Continental Resources Inc. have all announced plans to shut in output. Regulators in Oklahoma voted to allow oil drillers to shut wells without losing leases. New Mexico made a similar decision. North Dakota, which for years was synonymous with the U.S. shale revolution, is witnessing a rapid retrenchment. Oil producers have already closed more than 6,000 wells, curtailing about 405,000 barrels a day in production, or about 30% of the state's total. The output cuts won't be limited to the U.S. from Chad, a poor and landlocked country in Africa, to Vietnam and Brazil, producers are now either reducing output or making plans to do so. I wouldn't want to get sensational about it, but yes, clearly there must be a risk of shut-ins, Mitch Flegg, the head of the North Sea oil company, Surica Energy, said in an interview. In certain parts of the world, it is real and present, it is a real and present risk. In emergency board meetings last week, oil companies, small and large, discussed an outlook that the most somber that the most somber any oil executive has ever witnessed for the small firms the next few weeks will be all about staying afloat but even for the bigger ones like Exxon Mobil Corp and BP PLC it's a challenge i think about that it's even a challenge for someone like mobile exxon mobil and bp but reading on big oil will offer an insight into the crisis when companies report earnings this week Saudi Arabia, Russia and the rest of the OPEC Plus alliance will join the output cuts on Friday, slashing their output by more than 20% or 9.7 million barrels a day. Saudi Aramco, Aramco the state-owned company, is already trimming to reach the target. And Russian oil companies have announced exports of their flagship Urals crude would drop in May to a 10-year low. Even so, it may not be enough. Every week, 50 million barrels of crude are going into storage, enough to fuel Germany, France, Italy, Spain, and the UK combined. These numbers are just mind-boggling. At that rate, the world will run out of storage by June. What's not stored on shore is stashed in tankers. The US Coast Guard on Friday said there were so many tankers at anchor off California that it was keeping an eye on the situation. This is just a mind-boggling situation where people are storing oil. And here we can see an image of those tankers off the shore. Um, if you've ever been to Newcastle in Australia, you can see many tankers. Uh, well, they're not tankers, they can be cargo ships. But they're, as far as the eye can see, they're all stored, but they're waiting to get into port so they can actually offload their goods. But what you're looking at now is just a small snapshot of all of these tankers just lined up for as far as the eye can see, doing nothing but sitting there storing oil. It's, uh, it's pretty mind-boggling stuff here. So we can see that we're getting to the point now that it's costing too much to store this oil, and I hope that we don't get in a situation where they, for some reason, have overflows and start pouring oil into the land and ocean. That is, if they don't have the right resources to shut down these oil rigs, hopefully it's as simple as just flicking a switch. But of course, many, if you're not new to production, 
many production factories and so forth, it costs more money to turn it off and then turn it back on than it is to keep it going. And that's why it's particularly in smelting factories. You see smelting factories, you know, where they're smeltering uh, steel and other commodities. They, they keep them going the whole time because it costs too much to turn it off and fire it up. And that's why they're off, operating 24-7. But to actually shut down an oil rig, well, let's see what happens when these oil rigs are going to go into caretaker mode. Never in my life did I think that we would have too much oil. I can remember clearly as a boy asking my father, Dad, will we have enough oil when I grow up? And he promised me we would. For many years, I didn't believe him. But perhaps it's, it's coming to fruition. Uh, during this time as well, we can see that we still have the development of batteries and solar and other forms of energy. Perhaps even we've seen uh, the invention of the hydrogen cell and hydrogen engines. Um, who knows? Could this be the end of the oil industry forever? Or is it just a glitch in the matrix? Uh, leave the comments below, I'd love to know. But reading on before we close off. Before the crisis hit, the world was consuming about 100 million barrels a day. Demand now, however, is somewhere between 65 and 70 million barrels. So in a worst case scenario, about a third of global output needs to be shut. One third of global output. If there's anything good with this, of course, it's the environment. All this oil we're not burning is clearing up skies, clearing up our breathing air, and we've seen many images around the world where uh, many bird a lot of bird life is returning to where you'd never seen it before. I've also heard of stories uh, in many parts of the world that people have never really seen the stars before because there's always either light pollution or air pollution. But now we can see that, in fact, many people are seeing stars for the first time, in some cases, in their lives. So there is certainly an impact, positive impact, about this on the environment. But as economies collapse, as I've spoken about in other videos, it's a constant battle between economy and environment. As an economy collapses, the environment in many cases seems to benefit. And as an economy booms, the environment takes a really big hit. Examples of this is a blatant one, the Amazon. When we start chopping down those trees and selling them, a company is making a lot of money and countries are generating money and jobs and taxes and so forth. But of course, the environment is taking a massive hit. We also see it in China as they, their economy boomed their air quality was atrocious. But now we see the reverse. As the economy is taking a big hit, the environment, the quality of air and even water supplies is improving substantially. But reading on as we focus on the business side of this, the reality is likely to be less severe as storage would continue to bridge the gap between supply and demand. Plus, oil traders say consumption has probably hit a bottom and will start a very gentle recovery. Well, that could be true as we can see that the coronavirus um, lockdowns are starting to lift in many parts of the world. People are going to start driving more. Perhaps planes will start flying more. Planes being a massive consumer of oil, uh, a huge consumer. If you ever want to burn money very quickly, get a plane or a jet and watch that fuel bill go. The next biggest burner of fuel is, of course, boats and ships. Depending on what size you're doing and how far you're going, these things use massive amounts of fuel. But when they're not moving, as we can see even... Uh, oil tankers just sitting in an ocean and planes grounded, this fuel is not being burnt. Combined with cars not driving to and from work and around town, fuel is just sitting there. It's not doing anything. But, as this says, uh, there could be a very gentle recovery. Moving on, refiners shut. But before that takes hold, the great shutdown will spread through oil refining too. Over the past week, Marathon Petroleum Corp, one of the biggest US refiners, announced it would stop production at a plant near San Francisco. Royal Dutch Shell PLC has idled several units in three U.S. refineries in Alabama and Louisiana. And across Europe and Asia, many refineries are running at half rate. U.S. oil refiners process just 12.45 million barrels a day on the week to April 17, the lowest amount in, the least, in at least 30 years except for hurricane-related closures. More refinery shutdowns are coming, oil traders and consultants said particularly in the US, where lockdowns started later than in Europe and demand is still contracting. Steve Sawyer, director of refining Fact, at Fact Global Energy, said that global refineries could halt as much as 25% of the capacity in May. No one is going to be able to dodge this bullet. So, interesting article there from Bloomberg uh, and very well written, I think. I do wonder what will happen in the whole oil industry. As I said, when I wrote, uh, released a video about the petrodollar. I alluded in that video that I believe it's going to be a step to war and 
this in any case, as we shut down the oil industry, is certainly going to be a step to destabilisation. Destabilisation of massive companies that were used to essentially printing free money by pulling this, uh, this liquid gold out of the ground. Of course, uh, it's not free to pull oil out of the ground. There's a lot of work, there's a lot of risk, there's a lot of investment. But once you set up that investment and you set up that supply chain and those flows, it is a very smooth process in the sense that big money is made from keeping the ships moving and keeping the oil wells on and keeping the consumer buying. If you take away any component of that, the system breaks down and people start losing huge amounts of money. I heard from back home in Australia, in some places, in some cities, petrol is selling for half price. Some say that we won't see negative oil again. Uh, others say we will. I'd like to know your thoughts. Is this the beginning of the recovery? recovery for the oil industry, or are we again going to see oil going into negative prices? If you're getting anything out of this, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe. Before we close off, let's get into a joke for the day. A very fitting joke here. A couple of drops of water if you can't see the screen. The uh, hydrogen says to the drop of oil, hey oil, wanna hang out? The oil replies, I can't mix with you guys. Hydrophobe. Uh, that was terrible, but pretty um, relative to what we've been talking tonight, talking about tonight. Let me know your thoughts below, unless you've got a better joke. That's all I've got for you now. I'm Adam Stokes. Don't hit, forget to hit that like and subscribe. Thanks for listening. Happy investing, and I'll talk to you next time.